we have endured much over these last few years. Millions have died in a world-historic pandemic. A ragtag group of aged LARPers and low-information dude bros attempted the most incompetent coup in living memory. And every step of the way, these wounds have been salted with piece after overwrought piece of substandard editorial journalism. Dripping from the fourth estate like sludge from an East River pipe, each one has been duller and more predictable than the last. A few distinct causes appear. Racism, misogyny, the ever-reliable tone deafness of a post-Citizens United DNC, economic anxiety. But none has possessed the explanatory scope we've come to demand in this scientific age. Until now. In this video essay, I propose a hypothesis that accounts for the multitude of GOP positions that have hitherto been brushed off as barely related, if not entirely arbitrary. What I aim to show is that there is, in fact, a comprehensive explanation for these seemingly scattered positions. And like so many of the Republicans' impediments, it originated in Africa. In 1995, a report surfaced in National Geographic that alluded to a new drug craze turning Zambian children into veritable zombies. Called Jankum, this unusual high was purportedly derived from the fumes of human waste that had been placed in a container and allowed to ferment for one to three weeks. When inhaled, these fumes were said to cause euphoria and hallucinations, as well as impart to the user a sense of fearlessness. Does this sound familiar? It should, because these are the exact side effects we currently observe in the behaviors of the Republican Party's most prominent members. Could Jenkum be the culprit? That is precisely what I aim to show. But first, let me head off any rival pharmacological hypotheses. After all, it is reasonable to ask if it is not more parsimonious to attribute the cause of these behavioral symptoms to another more common drug, perhaps a less esoteric one whose effects are better known and indeed more certain to exist at all. I submit that it is not. And the reason for this, first and foremost, is that we have documentary evidence in the form of countless legal depositions, public statements, and criminal convictions that this group of people is defined by an all-consuming desire to expose themselves and others to the scent of their own emissions. Anyone who has spent time in D.C. these last few years will attest to the truth of rumors that Florida's Matt Gates, a prominent representative of what I call the Jankumhofer Caucus, habitually pressures male colleagues into smelling his fingers. Multiple explanations for this behavior have been proffered by our out-of-touch cultural elites, from the prurient and illegal to the merely prurient. What the media has missed, though, is that it is also accounted for by the phenomenon Jenkum users affectionately refer to as J-bumping, a mode of inhalation in which the Jenkum is spread across the forefinger and sniffed. Addicts have recourse to this method in situations where the typical mode of consumption, huffing a viscous brown substance directly from a polyethylene bag, would draw unwanted attention, in the middle of a floor vote, for instance. But J-bumping is less effective than straight huffing due to the diliative effects of the surrounding air, and thus more of it is required to achieve the typical effect. This brings us to some further considerations on the subject of consumption. In order to get the full effect of Jankum, there must be an unbroken path 
from excreta to lung. Without it, the fumes will fail to have the desired effect. However, this pathway is impossible to establish, much less maintain, when one is required to, say, comply with rigorous masking mandates. Hence the GOP's position on masking. This relatively new policy stance, which continues to flummox onlookers, has long been considered totally bananas. The ones who pay the heaviest price, after all, would be the GOP's base of aged hover-round enthusiasts. But under the Jinkum hypothesis, devotion to the Jinkum high trumps all, and so the decision to surrender this base to the arbitrary whims of a cruel and indifferent nature is entirely predictable. Indeed, it is precisely what we would expect of a depraved cult that is strung out on its own gases. But the question remains, why feces? What in the world would possess the overwhelming majority of a major political party to, quote, hit the bag, unquote, despite the well-documented human aversion to this substance? The answer, as science shows, can be found at the very heart, so to speak, of the conservative worldview. In their paper, Fecal Avoidance and Selective Foraging, Do Wild Mice Have the Luxury to Avoid Feces?, Patrick T. Walsh et al. observed that wild mice, unlike their domesticated brethren, do not steer clear of areas contaminated by feces. In fact, they seem to prefer it. The reason for this comes down to threat assessment. While the presence of feces can signal the potential for parasites, it can also indicate that the area is safe from predators, since the previous animal stayed around long enough to do its business. Because the domesticated mouse needn't account for the threat of predation in its calculations, it focuses on the parasite part. The wild mouse focuses on not being eaten. Developments in psychology have shown us that Conservatives are unusually sensitive to fear-based politics. Everyone from immigrants to non-binary college students to CRT-addled blacks are seen as existential threats. Add to this the fundamental solipsism of the conservative worldview, and you have a contingent of very frightened, very lonely people. When this is a person's reality, the health concerns of huffing poo take a back seat to the comfort that they can derive from the knowledge that they are safe. A full toilet in the house women's room may repulse AOC, but to MTG, it is proof that the previous occupant wasn't snatched up by a trans interloper. An empty toilet provides no such assurance. Furthermore, Jankum provides relief from their fundamental solipsism through communal consumption. Whether it's through the use of another's excrement, or by sharing one's own ordure with other connoisseurs, a sense of camaraderie forms. And it is from this camaraderie that the modern GOP was born. Undoubtedly, the Jankum hypothesis will have its naysayers. Despite its impressive explanatory scope, there will be those who find it unconvincing on the grounds that so many Congress people cannot possibly be addicted to a substance this gross, bad for you, or clearly just a prank. They will object further, I expect, on the grounds that a fake news report about a made-up drug consisting of fermented human shit is too outlandish to seriously consider. To viewers so inclined, I can only respond thus. Do your own research.